Greetings, friends. My name is Jessa McLean, and I'm here to provide you with some blueprints of disruption. This weekly podcast is dedicated to amplifying the work of activists, examining power structures, and sharing the success stories from the grassroots. Through these discussions, we hope to provide folks with the tools and the inspiration they need to start to dismantle capitalism, decolonize our spaces, and bring about the political revolution that we know we need. Quite often, the policies and platforms that come out of the NDP have members scratching their heads and wondering where they found themselves on the political spectrum. One needs to just look at the most recent election in Alberta, for example, the so-called progressive party advocating for more pipelines, lowering business taxes, and refusing to intervene in the housing market on behalf of renters. We've discussed these bad policies on the show before, and we've heard plenty of theories as to why the NDP is drifting to center, why they're abandoning their socialist roots. Today's episode, our interview with Martin Lukacs of The Breach and The Guardian, provides a lot of insight into what, or rather who, is behind these capitulations to capital. Martin's recent article in The Breach titled, Lobbyists Run Today's NDP and they're warping the party's politics. That obviously caught my eye, and I needed to know more. I don't want to give too much away, but the same folks we've labeled as party brass and the inner circle, they aren't just poor strategists for the NDP. They're also lobbyists for some of the worst companies out there. Martin covers the roles and connections to the party these lobbyists have extensively in his article. We've linked it in the show notes. But here in this interview, we get a little extra insight and some tidbits he left out. Let's listen in. Welcome to Blueprints, Martin. Can you introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, Hey, Jessa. Thanks for having me. I'm um, the managing editor of The Breach, uh, a left-wing media outlet that launched two years ago. I used to um, write for The Guardian and have been a you know, an activist involved in social movements for verging on 20 years now. You're making yourself sound old there. (laughs) Well, I'm about, I'm almost 40, so (laughs) won't keep that a mystery. No, I can relate um, without giving anything away. (laughs) Now, I can't imagine there's very many people in the audience that haven't heard of The Breach. Can you tell us just a little bit about it? Just in case. It's uh, an independent online outlet that was launched in 2021. And we say that um, we do journalism for transformation. And to us, that means that we speak truth, um, not to power, which a lot of journalists like to think they do. We speak truth about power. Um, We try to explain who wields power in our society, to what end, to whose benefit, and how ordinary people can have more of it if they organize. Um, one of our mottos is journalism for transformation. Ultimately, we don't think journalists change the world. Social movements do, but journalism can be of assistance to movements, um, while being, you know, rigorous and credible. And so we try to kind of straddle those two lines. Speak about power. That's good. We do a lot of that here on Blueprints. So at least we like to think that we do, but you never know, Martin, maybe they are reading The Breach as well, and you are speaking to them on occasion. <laughs> Let's hope. Um, we've talked a lot about the NDP in terms of talking about power structures, how they work. We think progressives should be familiar with that. It, it tends to be seen as the only option for us lefties. Uh, you know, that's an argument that could be had elsewhere, but generally speaking, And we've talked quite a bit about the consultant class specifically, like we've gone into detail on how they handle conventions and control candidate selection and policy, um, how they're generally responsible for the turn to center. We had Matt Forder on to talk about his book there that ties a lot of this together. Uh, But here I have to give a shout out to that the article you wrote the NDP is run by a consulting class geared towards capitulation, right? Uh, the subtitle there is Liberal NDP Pact Reveals Core Tenets of the Unimaginative Advisors Setting the Party's Direction. I like, I maliciously giggle when I read that headline because it feels so validating 
to go through that article. And it's kind of what a lot of the grassroots members have been screaming for a long time. But, you know, we don't get a lot of reach. It's nice to see uh, an outlet like The Breach shed some light on this. But you go into detail. You don't just outline the inner circle control, right? Um, But you go through the various ways, like we have on the show, where they've really entrenched themselves at this inner circle that you speak of. And in the most recent article is why I really reached out. Like, that's generally what we're going to talk about here today is you specifically get into the lobbyists. To me, that you've made this almost, and this is no no slight to you, a sinister tie. It's not just about like elitism. It's not just saying, oh, a small circle of people control a party that should be a grassroots movement. And that's a bad strategical choice because da 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 da. This is outlining lobbyists that have very trusted positions within the party that shape the campaigns that we see, which then really shape the Canadian political spectrum on the left. And they are having day jobs with big oil and gas, with real corporate interests in mind daily, right? That's what they advocate for. What what drew your attention to this? Like, how did you make this connection? You know, was it Nathan Rotman? Did he open the floodgates and you wanted to know just how many more there were, how how entrenched it was? Um, That's a good question. And no, the the Nathan Rotman angle, which for the listeners who 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 didn't note that we we can mention that, um, you know, the Alberta NDP campaign manager was um, someone who's, you know, been a a core kind of operative in the party for the last 20 years. He his current day job is as a policy um, official for, uh, Airbnb, um, a job in which he does a lot of lobbying of the federal government. And I imagine the U S government as well, um, or the the New York state. Um, no, that wasn't the first time that I had noted that. Um, I, I have been struck for years watching many of these, you know, as you say, kind of top officials kind of circulate between these, lobbying, lobbying gigs, um, and, you know, holding top spots in during campaigns, whether provincial or federal. Um, and yeah, when the, when there was a bit of attention on, on Rotman, it to me just seemed like a great moment to, um, to pull together all the threads, um, and help people understand that it's not just, you know, one, one rotten uh, apple in the barrel. Um, it's a systemic problem. Um, and it very much to my mind is, um, the culmination, um, or even like a canary in the, the coal mine or canary, canary in the tar sands mine in this case, um, for the direction the NDP has been heading in, especially the last 20 years. Um, so I wanted to kind of understand how it, how it came to be. Because it, what you describe in the article is very similar to what you get into in your book when you're talking about the liberals and how they have a certain persona, progressive, softer, gentler, better hair, um, progressive, and meanwhile are run by corporate lobbyists and it, it shapes Canadian policy, like Canadian policy that we find abhorrent especially when in the trade of arms and the lack of action on climate. And then we know that the NDP is largely trying to replace the liberals in many provinces and mimic them in any other form. So that is, it, it's like the receipts are there that should the NDP have power in the same way the liberals have gained power, use the same model successfully, one worries. And, you know, we've gone to the example of BC. <laughs> So many times, it's almost like I imagine the audience is even rolling their eyes at the mention of the BC NDP, of, of course. But it, it's like that's what happens when you allow lobbyists to work on the party. Because one of the biggest critiques I saw that repeated, you know, I was reading the comments. I never read the comments, but I read the comments. Hmm. 
And we, all read, we all read the comments. Yeah, it, it's a toxic trait of mine. And um, some of the pushback that I saw was, can't people have a day job? And as someone who's worked in the tobacco industry and, and you know, I've had some gigs in the insurance sector uh, to, to pay the bills, I feel that a little bit. I can relate to that kind of critique, but... I mean, do you have a response that I I do, but I'm sure, you know, you've thought about that. You, you were just singling out a few folks. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone knows if, when they're being honest that you can only indulge a vice for so long before it becomes part of who you are, right? Um, like, I know, you know, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde story, like, you know, that for people who don't know the story, that starts with Dr. Jekyll being like, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll just allow Mr. Hyde to do a little, a little nighttime roaming, you know, a little sin and mayhem. Um, but eventually, you know, Mr. Hyde's personality seeps into Dr. Jekyll's and then, and, do, and then finally dominates him entirely. Um, and I think that all the habits of mind and habits of practice of a lobbyist, namely serving power, you know, accommodating to the status quo, having an aversion to, you know, the perspectives of working class people, that ends up seeping into the, into the mentality of the party. Um, now, I'm not saying that this, this is why the party apparatus is the way it is. I think that the lobbyist turn within the NDP is, is, a, is more of a consequence than a cause of where the party is now. But it does play a role now in reinforcing the party culture um, and I, and I write about that in the article, you know, I, I, I outline like all the roles that first, all the roles that people do have now, which I think are worth mentioning, like, you know, um, one of the top comms people, Cheryl Oates in the, in the Alberta NDP campaign lobbies for coal and Uber, Nathan Rotman, of course, lobbies for Airbnb, um, Brian top, who I think is probably the, perhaps the most influential, you know, operative in the party. He, uh, runs his from own coast firm. to coast he, from coast to coast you know he runs his own firm and they've lobbied for bank of montreal mccain foods the railway giant cn one of canada's largest cannabis corporations the list goes on um brad levine is another one who of course has been very influential in the party um he's a partner in uh what what is a liberal firm um he's probably the most um, widespread lobbyist. I mean, I heard stories that I didn't include in the article about how NDP staffers would like groan about how often they got calls from Levine uh, to all his former NDP colleagues um, trying to work their relationships to get meetings for his clients, you know? Um, Brad Levine, like, he, he, he was kind of, he was working to support the NDP um, campaign during this past election in Alberta while he was simultaneously lobbying Danielle Smith's office for the largest frack gas producer in Canada. So literally having his cake and eating it too. Um, and, you know, so, so, so I, I, what, what this article for me w about was like, yeah, you know, trying to outline as comprehensively as possible, this new revolving door between lobbying firms and, and top party officials. But then I tried to kind of figure out, I hadn't seen it written about before, like why, why is that the case? Why has this come about? And to my mind, there's basically three developments that have gotten us to this point. And the first is the party's rightward turn, you know, from the 90s onward, first provincially, then federally. From the time um, of Leighton. Yeah, definitely. Leighton is like the moment, you know, where it really consolidates federally. Um, and to me, to my mind, the second key development, which I think also doesn't really get that the, the political right word turn definitely gets talked about, you know, lots of analysis out there. Matt Fodor's book is a good one uh, for that. But the, the second development was that kind of the introduction of profit making into progressive politics, you know, through the turn to marketing that happens like in the 90s at the same time as neoliberalism is, is becoming ascendant. And so you see like the harnessing of all the tools used to sell consumer goods, ads, focus groups, micro targeting for election campaigning. And you see the emergence of, you know, for profit firms like now communications. Um, 
And so I think that those two in, in tandem with a third, which is the kind of middle classization of the party, um, the kind of hollowing out of working class um, operatives, which happens like, again, this is a, this is a generational, multi-generational shift. But I think those three developments kind of came together to make it, you know, possible for NDP officials who had kind of pragmatically embraced the market and neoliberal politics and who'd accepted that politics could actually be like a lucrative pursuit, you know, from then it was just a small step to these people actually becoming corporate lobbyists themselves. Um, and my, to my mind, like, you know, that now kind of comes full circle and those lobbyists, you know, it's, if, in fact, in fact, the very same people, Rotman, Brad Levine, Brian Topp, Anne McGrath, the very same people who consolidated that political shift, that centralization, that elevation of, of, of consultants to making the key decisions in the party also became the same people who have benefited from lobbyist jobs. See, that's really frustrating to hear again, because a lot of the critiques and things that I understood about politics was, you know, a lot of people do things to be elected, but then some people act in ways that clearly show that they don't even care if they win another seat. I'm thinking like Doug Ford, to be honest, you know, it was like slash and burn. And we know that they're working towards their next gig, right? Like keeping corporate interests happy and, and, and certain clients happy can often lead to a sweet gig after politics as well. So that pipeline, you know, I didn't expect to see that kind of politics to corporate pipeline was something that often eluded uh, the NDP, right? It's actually usually detrimental to work for the NDP and then try to get a corporate gig, but not when your policies then start benefiting those same corporate interests and you are responsible for making sure that the leftist party is advocating for neoliberal solutions and, you know, listening to big oil and gas lobbyists. My follow-up kind of question, or it was supposed to be a two-parter question, and, and you, you answered it there, and it's, it's kind of funny with that story about uh, Brad Levine making those calls and using those connections, because I was trying to give, like, the benefit of the doubt, can people maybe wear two hats? I mean, you, you, you slayed that as soon as you started speaking, you know, think, with your Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde story, but that's very damning to hear, I think, for the party and particularly for the folks who volunteer a lot of time within the party that then do a lot of work in these movements, knowing that they're actually contributing to a counter movement against them in a way. Yeah, I mean, to me, to me, that's the most damning detail, which I discovered doing the research was that... Um, and this is like a, a strange ironic twist, but but people like Levine and McGrath. I mean, I think that their politics are well intentioned, and I and I do think like like Dr. Jekyll and Hyde, they have you know they they have they contain multitudes, you know, and they have contradictory poles. But one one of the honestly most damning elements of all this, in terms of in terms of the kind of enrichment that that we tend to expect from liberal and conservative staffers and politicians is that um, Levine and McGrath deliberately skirted rules around um, around curbing lobbying influence that have been brought up by none other, none other than Stephen Harper, right? Like he instituted a ban on he instituted a ban on political staffers jumping straight after they leave their jobs to lobbying firms. He instituted a five year ban. So that was actually a good thing that Stephen Harper did. Now, when Levine and McGrath were working in the party, they skirted those rules by having themselves hired not as political staffers, but as House of Commons staff. So that meant that as soon as they left their NDP jobs, Levine in 2012 and McGrath, I think in 20, um, also around a similar time, no earlier, she left a little earlier, um, they were able to jump ship straight into lobbying firms and they didn't have to respect that five year five year rule. So that f for people who believe the NDP should be filled with people who are deeply principled, that is indeed quite 
damning. Um, and, um, you know, I got like, there's one other, there's an interesting email I got. Um, and I think this is like a cultural, this is a deep cultural shift that has happened in the NDP over several decades. I got a really interesting email from Mark Ellison, who, for listeners who don't know, he was like the federal director of research for Tommy Douglas and then David Lewis. And then I think he was like the CEO of Ontario Hydro under Ray and and then under and then CEO of BC Hydro under uh, uh, Harcourt, Mike Harcourt in, um, in BC. And and he was like, he was like, you nailed it on the head. Um, he in his like 50 years in the party has he has seen first, he said he saw firsthand this change in the NDP professional staff from people who were activists and researchers and working class people to people who then became like communication spin doctors and wannabe corporate lobbyists. That's how he put it. Um, and yeah, so. It's like chicken or the egg, right? You, you talked about earlier whether it was a consequence or the cause of this, this turn to center, but. I think we're going to add in the, you haven't spoken about her yet, but Jennifer Howard. We're going to add in Jennifer Howard to this discussion. Our audience might be familiar with her. She's the chief of staff. You speak about her in detail in the article I mentioned earlier about the consultant class, you know, where you detail this this, this small group. Because they have far reaches. Even though they have titles like chief of staff uh, for Jagmeet Singh, Jennifer Howard has her hand in the NDP across the country. Same with Brian Topp. You list a lot of the positions he holds now or did in the Alberta election and, and a little more recently, but quite literally on all levels. Like we've talked about, we've talked about him at conventions in Ontario, making decisions on what policies can hit the floor, you know, holding positions in committees that control narratives and I don't know how he finds the time for all of this, to be honest, but we all knew, or at least the audience, when I say we, and a lot of NDPers who've been through the ringer, knew the reach of all of these folks, had a million reasons to be upset with him, like the turn to center, for example. But seeing the very deliberate nature of how they've maneuvered themselves into the party and then the interest that they advocate for seems to be making the argument for a real infiltration of the working class party of people rising to the top of the party, even though they hold views like you mentioned, like Jennifer Howard. That's why I brought her into the discussion where she she doesn't even believe Canada Canadians are interested in, in real change. That's very disheartening to read. And so for these people to just all rise to the top and then hold these corporate interests to me, like, would you describe it as infiltrations or is this because it surely wasn't organic. The very people you're talking about hold held great sway under Layton. The, the same clique continues to run the show. Right. So it might feel that way if we kind of start the film reel in the present, you know, um, but I mean, to my mind, the NDP has never been a, a working class party. I mean, a lot of these tensions between, you know, working class socialist politics and a more kind of technocratic, um, you know, social democratic or social liberalism, you know, they date back to the very origins of the party when, you know, the League for Social Reconstruction was battling with and outmaneuvering the labor socialists who also helped found the, the party, right? So, um the party has always been a multi-class, cross-class formation. Um, and if anything, one of the, the the things that's dynamics that's hindered the NDP has been that actually it's not rooted enough in, um, in the working class and class politics have um, not been as strong in large part because of the ten, much more tenuous links to labor unions in that the NDP had as compared to social democratic parties elsewhere in the, in the world. So, um, I think what is, what is true is that we have seen, um, a centralization of the party, um, um, whereby, you know, a very narrow band of consultants, uh, who, as you say, cycle through federal and provincial campaigns across the country, hold an inordinate amount of power and they 
they they haven't been elected, obviously, um, and there's much to question about their politics. Uh, I, and I do think like one of the reasons why it's not a bigger issue is that much of it happened federally under Layton, and you know Layton, you know Jack Layton is seen as like you know the progressive standard bearer of the NDP, and in many ways he was. Um, and in his roots, um, but in the same way that only Nixon could go to China is a, a line I think that um, Murray Cook and Dennis Pilon use. The, the same way that only Nixon could go to China diplomatically, um, a lot of these neoliberal transformations of the party could only have happened under someone like Layton. Um, he helped manufacture a lot of consent for them. Um, and I think it's in part because we don't, have um, a shared understanding of that history that a lot of this stuff flies under the radar. Um, and I, you know, um, you mentioned Jennifer Howard. I mean, Jennifer Howard to me is a good example that um, the fact that there are so many lobbyists now circulating through the party um, is not a complete explanation of why they have the politics that they do. So someone like Jennifer Howard, as far as I know, has never been a lobbyist. Another, you know, influential figure, someone like Mike, but Michael Balagas, who I know you have had interactions with, um, working, working within the Ontario NDP. He also, as far as I know, has never worked as a lobbyist. Um, but they share a lot of the same, the highly moderated, highly unambitious, uh, political views. Um, and I think that the it's those political views, it's holding those political views in which you no longer think that, you know, substantive transformation is actually possible or even desired that leads you to be like, oh, hey, maybe it's OK to shill for an oil company or uh, a frack gas company or um, one of the platform giants. Um, you know, I, I actually listened to an interview with Michael Balgus recently on... Um, the David Hurl podcast. I don't know if you listened to it. Um, and I found it like incredibly instructive. Um, Balgus was talking about the recent um, Ontario election, but he was drawing like general um, conclusions about where people are at. And it was fascinating that he, he suggested that like people in Ontario have a greater frustration with liberal politicians, quote, liberal politicians, academics and activists than they do with CEOs. I think he's talking about himself. Uh, well, this is the thing. I, I do think I do think a great deal of projection is is involved, um, because if you read the polls, it, it's rather different. The, the opinions of, uh, of people. I mean, he also said this about um, incre like inc the increasing taxes on the wealthy. He, he suggested that people's response to that is that well, the wealthy will never pay. They'll just hire better accountants or leave town. I mean, that, and that to, to some degree is true and that they, that would be a strategy that they would employ. But that's not, I think, what most people, he's just repeating status quo talking points. Um, and, then he, and, then he, and then he finished it off by saying that he thinks people think that the rich shouldn't even pay more because why should they? They earned it. There is a sense that people who have, who have money have earned it and they should be left alone. Um, I mean, that, of course, is a... Is, it's, it will be startling to most people. Um, I mean, 90% of people in the country support a wealth tax. 60%, 67% think that the economy is rigged to serve the rich. Like um, He's handpicking statements from those market research surveys they spent all our donations on. Exactly. You know, that fit <laughs> the plan he implemented, right? Because surely he's got to give evidence as to why he decided to shape up that campaign that way. Um, and the one before that. <laughs> so um, also not to slight folks, but they are very well paid. And it's one of the arguments has always been in representation. How can someone who is, doesn't struggle understand the struggle and and buy into the solutions that are needed? So, yeah, it's very disheartening to hear and then understand the level of influence they hold that these folks have no hope, right? The Jack's letter and all those words that we brand, they don't even buy into it. You know, when you get them in interviews, it's not just, 
how we perceive them. It's when they open their mouth and give statements, it becomes clear that, you know, they're not in it for the fight. Yeah. Yeah. A friend of mine, but they sell it very well. Yeah. No, a friend of mine joked that, that all these, um, professional operatives should by necessity have the, do these kinds of interviews before they get hired, not after they've lost several elections and are, you know, going on their liberal friends talk show or podcast, um, to lay out their views. I mean, yeah, most people I think don't know that this is what um, the people running the show think. Um, but th- but th- these people are slick. They're, they're, they yeah. could give these interviews and they would have completely different stories for us, right? They would tell sure. us of hope and change and transformation. But this to me also, it gets to why it has become completely normalized within a tier of the party to go and work for a high-powered corporate lobbying firm. Like if you, if you believe these things, if you believe that people are actually cool with CEOs and what they, who they really hate are activists and academics, if that's what you believe, um, then yeah, like it's just, it's just another job. It happens to be a really, really well-paid job, even better than they made as, um, as operatives within the party. Um, but, and that I think is the other, the really other really fascinating tidbit I came across during the research was that um, really great insight from Robin Sears, who's kind of like the er, like NDP turned lobbyist um, operative within the party. I think he, as early as 2004, started, um, he went to a liberal lobbying firm, I think. Um, he um, He's someone who I think worked for Broadband and and um, the party in the seventies. Um, he had this really interesting insight. Um, I mean, I think he, he, he meant this as, as, as a compliment, but he said that, that, that it's a great thing and a sign of, um, maturity that the party is turning out lobbyists now. And that one of the, one of the results that that would have is that as party officials became lobbyists, he hoped any peers would become more constrained in their attacks because they'd be quote unquote describing their friends. And I think that that does get to a really key element of the kind of social, the social, uh, you know, um, tax, um, that, that, that enters the picture, right? Like, so just the full quote was, they will change and will start to be more focused and discriminating in their attacks, pointing the gun at those who deserve to be pointed at rather than simply spraying bullets in every direction about how wicked the government relationships industry is. Um, and that is a, and the people I talk to, that is a dynamic. I mean, the people, one, this is, and this speaks to your question earlier, which is like, why are more people talking about this? Um, why isn't this a bigger issue? Um, because most of the people who know about it and who see it happening, the people who are called by Brad Levine, you know, to, you know, on behalf of TELUS or Uber or, you know, an oil company, to talk about it openly and criticize it, they would be describing their friends. And that's a hard thing to do. Especially in a political system with so few options. So they might not be friends, but they're the only hope, right? I think that's what keeps a lot of the membership finding rationale for it, right? Oh, Brian Top can do something in the day and then different when he volunteers on the weekend. Nonsense. Because what else are they going to do? They've, a lot of them, I've because I've talked to a lot of them on, you know, <laughs> why is this happening? And uh, a lot of the rationale is, you know, well, the liberals do it, they do it successfully, then they hold power. We need to do what these other political machines do because it works. You know, the Machiavellian approach, you need to play the same games and learn how to play them just as well um, to manipulate public discourse to first get power. Uh, But then I guess, you know, that's really hard to argue once you see what they've done with power. However, it's still that rationale that's employed you know, oh, well, that's politics. It's dirty. It's ugly. Um, but, you know, you have to expect that out of politics. Yeah. And I think I think it also misunderstands the nature of corporate lobbying. Like, I think people think that, yeah, oh, this is the fact that we are 
you know, we now have corporate lobbyists among us is a sign that we are a formidable political party, you know? And I think that's, that's the rationale. That's the story that people who want to justify this tell, right? Um, that, um, you know, it's the kind of, it's what comes with, it com- it's what comes with holding that and wielding that kind of power. But that's not what corporate, how corporate lobbyists see it and corporate lobbyist firms see it. They, they do this lobbying to neutralize uh, the threat that any political party might pose. Um, and so, I mean, the way, the way it generally works is the reason corporate lobbyists will, for instance, hire on NDPers is generally nowadays, like in the past, corporate lobbyists used to, firms used to either be liberal or Tory aligned, but they would always have a token liberal, a Tory firm would have a token liberal, liberal firms would have some token Tories. And now they all have NDPers as well. And when... They've been bought. That's well, how well, it sounds, well, you know? When a, when a firm is like war, you know, war gaming a c- scenario and they're figuring out what should their approach be to any particular government or um, they are thinking, okay, who has the best relationship with this official, with this cabinet minister, with this, with this MP, with this MLA? And... They will parcel it out. Well, they'll usually sit, you know, stick the NDP or on the NDP or the liberal on the liberal, or maybe they have personal relationships, and that's and that's how it gets done, right? Um, so it has nothing. It, it it is true that at the federal level, it was once it was it was once the NDP became uh, formal opposition that corporate lobby firms became interested in them. But it wasn't like it wasn't like to the NDP's credit or a sign that they had finally made it. It was more like firms were like, oh, we need to get, we need to get a handle on them and figure out how we can cut them down to size. Yeah. I think especially in provinces where the NDP is not even seen as a serious contender, any form of validation and the fact that we can play with the big guys, um, I can see that appealing to some folks, but I'll tell you this whole line of talk of neutralizing the threat that might exist within, that does exist within the working class and, you know, absorbing the acquiring assets, so to speak, really makes me mad. You know, I was sitting here making faces. So if you saw those, that's what that was. It was just really cringe because they understand it's a class war, right? You describe it even in, in battle terminology there, but, um, and it's like, we don't even have an asset on the battlefield anymore. Maybe, you know, you're making the argument there that also that maybe we never did, probably never did, at least in the electoral game. Um, no, but I just, think the, yeah. no, I think the NDP historically did. There have, you know, it has run, even when it was, I mean, it's never been an out and out socialist party, but it has oftentimes run campaigns that scared the shit out of the corporate class. I mean, you can think back to the campaigns that, um, David Lewis ran in the seventies, um, you know, on the, an entire campaign that revolved around calling out the corporate welfare bums, as he put it, you know, who had Canada over the barrel, working class people over the barrel. Um, I mean, that, that terrified the corporate class. Um, I also think when the, you know, something I was involved with when the leap manifesto made its appearance at the 2016 convention and, you know, to some degree won that convention and, Pose the possibility that the NDP might have a leftward turn. Similarly, the corporate and political class had an absolute meltdown, um, and concern trolled the party about, um, you know, about about that leftward turn being a disaster, supposed disaster for it. But they well knew that, I and mean, that too was projection, you know. And they they well knew that they they might not um, be fighting a one sided class war as they have been, you know, for these past decades. Um, so it, it, but you're right, like completely that one side, it's a very much a one-sided class war and the NDP is really not stepping up in the way that they could be. No, I mean, I was going to give you space to elaborate on the, I say you gave them a little leeway, the federal NDP in your article where, you know, it, there's no arguing the poli- the provincial entities of the NDP easy cases to make, right? You had an easy job there with Alberta and BC. Um, But for me, the federal party is 
is one in the same as what you see. It's just we've never seen them in power yet or, or close enough to power to really play their cards. But I didn't really have a question there, I guess. But I mean, I, I, can, I, mean, I can pick it up. Um, I do. I do think that that under under Jagmeet Singh, like there has been a break in terms of policy with the Leighton to Mulcair years strictly on the platform and the policies. So they, they have become more classically social democratic. They're advo- they've advocated for a wealth tax, for expanding social programs, limited public ownership. That is a, that is a break. That said, organizationally, ideologically, there has been no shift. And, and you can't have one without the other. So, I mean, let me tell you a story about just how shallow that, how shallow that ideological orientation is when it comes to policy. So a few years back when the Green New Deal was really taking off in the States, um, a few of us made an offer to the party to have AOC's advisor give a presentation to the NDP federal caucus um, about the Green New Deal. You know, seems totally reasonable, probably a good thing for them to do. They'd be excited. You think? Um, and we got back word that Jennifer Ka- Jugme was interested, Jennifer Howard and Anne McGrath kiboshed it. And the reason they kiboshed it was they said... Um, the, N- the, N- the MPs in Ottawa already have trouble sticking to bread and butter issues. As if the Green New Deal isn't like the bread and butter framework of our time, right? We don't get roses? I think, I think the party has adopted, at, you know, at, at the party center has adopted these policies, but they've, they, they, it's, it's not a deeply felt orientation. Um, they have seen, they have, some of them read the polls on like Balagas they, they've seen the, the which way the wind is blowing. They've seen the success of people like AOC and Sanders. They have seen the, the Green Party kind of like a few years ago um, eating into their polls. And so they are, they are kind of like they're mouthing, the, mouthing some of the right policies. But the problem, too, is that they don't, if they understood them deeply, they'd understand that you can't fight for them unless you do mass politics. Like there's no way that a social democratic agenda, not to met, ne- never mind like a Green New Deal or even more radical socialist politics, has a chance in hell of succeeding without simultaneously energizing a base of activists and a movement, you know? And they have no interest in building that. And that to my mind shows how shallow their interest actually is in a policy platform program that is more more progressive than it has been in decades. That yeah, that bread and butter comment raises a point for me because quite often when you're arguing with people, I don't know why we still have to do this, that the NDP is drifting to center or has drifted to center, they'll often point to certain MP private bills or petitions or statements. Leah Gazan uh, is a great example. Nikki Ashton, there's various folks that have done that outlying work. And most people inside the party know that those MPs actually face pushback when they don't stick to the whatever Jennifer Howard Howard and the Michael Balagas have declared as the bread and butter. Those aren't examples of the the party also advocating for these things. Those are just examples of courageous people within the party pushing ahead, knowing they're still going to get some slack. They'd better not pick up their phone for a couple of days kind of move that um, is distracting from the work that they're planning from the top, the top down. And that, that's exactly that's right. disheartening because that's exactly, that's exactly right. I do think that the party center give some leeway to members of the caucus who are overwhelmingly more progressive. I mean, the, I mean, the NDP caucus is left wing and principled um, and people like you mentioned, others like Peter Julian, you know, Peter Julian had a Green New Deal motion, right? So simultaneously, they can allow someone like Peter Julian to have a Green New Deal motion. Meanwhile, refuse to engage with Green New Deal politics at the core 
of the party. And I think, um, you know, that, 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 that says a lot about, um, the, that, that did, you know, that chasm that exists. Um, I also heard, I heard, I heard a really interesting story about, um, that came from a new MP who was getting his training on the Hill, um, after he got elected. And, um, one of the staffers doing the training told him, you need to know about FIFO. And he was, the MP was like, what's FIFO? He said, fit in or fuck off. And so like that, that's, that's what's being communicated from the, from the party center, right? Um, that, yeah, okay, maybe you can, you know, do some, you can, you know, you can play at some of these more radical socialist politics on the sidelines, but there's no way resources are going to get put into it. There's no way that the, that the apparatus of the party will seriously get behind pushing a Green New Deal. I, I would imagine most, most Canadians didn't even know that Peter Julian was pushing a Green New Deal private member's bill on the side. I'm not sure they're allowed to know. Right. I, I've sat at tables where Peter Julian and, and Matthew Green have advocated for publicly owned telecoms, spending time doing that work on, on you know, how that can come about. Meanwhile, the spokesperson and all the literature that comes out is talking about more competition within the privately owned telecoms. I can can you imagine how frustrating that is? Because, you know, there are good people there. Like you mentioned, there are left wingers within that caucus. But the retribution that they face for stepping out of bounds, they really do have to fit in or fuck off. Right. We've seen a lot of good people burn out and and leave politics altogether after trying to rub up against that system. <laughs> and so it's hard. You want them to be more courageous, right? You you want to know that these battles are happening behind the scenes. Um, but quite often, there's just not space given, right? If it wasn't for the breach, most people would not even know the details behind the lobbying that happens on the Progressive Party because of the fear that exists of tearing down the only option of exposing any flaws within that that hope that people have. And, uh, you know, you talked about social repercussions, but people also fear those political repercussions of giving any ammo to the enemy. And right. so the very people I, who would expose these things that we need to know within the party that so many progressives put their energies into. Uh, I also think, as, I, like, as you said earlier, a lot of people do, a lot of people working within the party do know about it. But I think also rightly they intuit that there's nothing they can really do about it. Like it's hard, there's hardly a mech, there's no mech, unlike, you know, unlike conventions where you do get to have a say in whether the leader should stay on, there's, there's no mechanism to vote on whether you think Brian Topp or Brad Levine is doing a competent job, you know? Um, and so there really is this kind of layer of unelected leadership effectively that runs, runs the party. But I think, I think it's, it's not possible to challenge it under the current leadership. Um, I mean, you can, you know, raise some noise about it. Um, but I think until they'll just kick you out. <laughs> yeah. They'll kick you out. Yes. Um, um yeah, like the conventions even themselves are completely structured by these same people and there's no room to maneuver there. So, you know, that was going to be my last question to you. You do hint at the end of the article. I get a feeling from you at the end of that article that you hold hope in a transformation in that party. But at the same time, I've read many, many articles and you've seen the liberals, how they're structured it's entrenched. Like it's not just the few personalities at the top anymore. Those personalities have spent 30 years. I feel so old all of a sudden again, really, really setting up the party so that it continues to operate in this way from province to province, right? Like they don't just rotate in and out of the lobbyist jobs. They, they move around. And they shape campaigns, but then they also shape executives and they teach staffers how to rinse and repeat 
like what you see in BC leadership races and all of all of that. Like it's it's just been replicated across the province. And you, that disdain that Michael Balagas talks about activists is I have seen it in him personally, but it's definitely felt within the party, you know, that there's no there's no room for activists there. It is a, it's a it's a hostile environment unless you're advocating against Doug Ford and you know you're 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 touting those lines. You're fitting in, um, but it's not just MPs that are told to fit in or fuck off. <laughs> so I hold no hope. Clearly, I've I've reiterated that a few times over. But do you have any glimmers? Like, because it you can't abandon electoral politics is what I've been told. Well, I. I do think some humility about the future is is useful for leftists. You know that there's that Frederick Jameson quote that it's easier to imagine an uh, an end of, end to the world than an end to capitalism. I do think that operates when it comes to thinking about parties like the NDP. Like I think it people find it easier to imagine the end of the world than the transformation of a social democratic party. Um, and I do think do do I have hope that the current political leadership of the party will change? No, of course not. Um, but um, I do think that the base of the party wants that. We, we, did, we saw that in 2016, where despite a, you know, a pretty furious attack from the Alberta NDP, um, the rank and file of the party overwhelmingly voted for the LEAP Manifesto. And the LEAP Manifesto, to my mind at that time, was really just a stand-in for a turn, a shift in the party. Um, people were seeing what was happening um, down south with Bernie Sanders. To some degree, they were they were looking at what was happening in the UK with Corbyn. And I actually think Canadian lefties should pay more attention to that experiment rather than the US, because I think that holds more lessons for us um, and what might be possible here. Um, I mean, the Corbyn project, you know, which elected a, a socialist who's actually far more radical than Bernie Sanders, uh, to the leadership of the la- to the leadership of the Labour Party, um, revitalized the membership. At one point, they had six hundred thousand members. It was diverse, multi-racial um, membership. Um, and then, of course, it went down into went down to defeat because it was destroyed by the culture war of Brexit, which s- split its coalition. But while and also internally, it was there was a ferocious um, attack on it internally from the right wing of that party. Um, but I think there are important lessons about what might be possible for a social democratic party um, to be found there. Um, and one of the things I learned is that, yeah, with the current leadership and the party brass being such as it is, no, I think internal reform efforts at this point are just you're just you're just hitting your head against the wall. It's an exercise in masochism. Um, I think that I feel what that. <laughs> you know, but I, but I do think it's Im- I. I, I do think what is important right now is to build the power of independent social movements um, and to elevate consciousness about what the NDP currently is. Um, and I think to prepare ourselves for a moment when we, you know, we might be able to mount a challenge for the leadership. Um, and I think if you had socialists leading a socialist leading the party just as you had in the UK that could operate as a kind of pincer movement where you the leadership at the new leadership at the top opens up the party to grassroots energy from below you know um and um and i think in that kind of context yeah i i i do be- i do believe that the party has a role to play as a vehicle for transformative politics in this country. It could operate as a kind of giant lever for um, mobilizing around mobilizing around and cohering the disparate um, social movement demands in this country. You know, the struggle for indigenous rights, the struggle against austerity, the struggle against anti-racism. Um, right now, those movements have get no hearing, as you say, in the party. The party leadership is quite averse um, to the messiness and, um, 
but also the vision and energy and power of those social movements. Um, so I think, yeah, I, um, I, I, I do think it would be a disservice to, to tell people that the party is reformable. I, I, I don't think it is, but I do think that, um, we should leave that option open, um, to attempting to transform transform the NDP because I do think that's where the that's where the membership is at and and always has been despite you know like uh, people the in, probably huge amount of outflow of activists that we've seen at every disappointing turn betrayal um, that we've seen in the last several years you know um, I don't think anyone should have too much certitude about this stuff because. It's hard, it's hard it's hard to know I, I I could see a I could see a future in which the NDP is l even less relevant than it is now but our movements are are so much stronger that um, that we are making incredible gains in this country um, but I think I think we I think to ask that question is to put the cart before the horse to some degree like I do think the the left also needs to build up its power Um yeah, who knows well, happens well, for sure. under different elect, political circumstances, yeah, right? With strong you know, social movements. Elect, elect it's 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 really important to elect, you know, left wing MPs, get socialists elected. Um I think it would be important if we want to, you know, think blue sky, like probably a kind of coalition or federation of movements could be that is more than a sum of its parts, could be a really important you know, initiative to try to organize at some point, which would which would bring together left MPs, left 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 wing parts of the labor movement, progressive organizations, social movements, something that could um, deter something like what happened in the UK example from happening, namely a like a, a vicious counterattack from the right right wing of the party if if a socialist were to get elected. Um, but I do think that the party being the party brass being so closed off as they are to a different kind of politics, that's the only conceivable next step in which the, the party could end up looking very different than it does now. I see where you're going. And yet my first thought was, if we looking at the Corbyn example is, is what eventually happened to Corbyn. So, you know, electing a socialist leader, say at a convention, knowing how conventions are run right now, not only seems impossible at the moment. I don't even like using that word, but say you were successful knowing the apparatus that's in place and that the right wing of the party is actually the ruling class. You know, it's not just a segment that can get organized. It's actually the folks who call executive meetings and set the actual agenda. Um, I believe they would burn a leader, uh, burn that political capital that might exist even with that leader, despite just like we saw with Corbyn? Well, first, dis despite the vicious attacks from the Parliamentary Labour Party, the right wing of the party, Corbyn was still able to enact their agenda. And I think it was, ultimately it was Brexit that really, really damaged his prospects. I mean, I remember I spoke at one point to um, the director of strategy and comms for for Jeremy Corbyn, uh, Seamus Milne. Um, and I remember him telling me that when he came, he came in to head up the communications department, he had 60 people or so working under him. And of those, maybe only five weren't actively trying to sabotage their work at every turn. So that's pretty incredible. Um, and they were still able to accomplish all that they did despite that. I, I actually don't think that- How exhausting. Yeah. From your within, right? You, you, From within. People don't I, understand I don't, that about politics. I don't, I don't think the, well, it is true that the NDP has gone, undergone this kind of Blairite third way transformation. I don't think it's as r resolutely ideological as the UK party. And I do think that apart from the, you know, kind of the, the top of the, the apparatus. Um, I think staffers in the the middle ranks. I think people who are who serve on executives. Um, people who are who work within writing associations, and certainly its membership. Um, wouldn't I think I, I think they would actually welcome a shift in direction. Um, and I don't think 
while there undoubtedly would be battles to be fought if something like this were to happen, I don't think they would be as uh, as bloody as as we saw in in um, in in with Corbin. You know what I mean? Um, that's my sense. I mean, who knows? You never Maybe know. Maybe we'll find these, out one day. You never know how these things are. Um, <laughs> we'll place yeah, a I friendly mean, we, bet. <laughs> I mean, we did. We did. I mean, we did. We did get a taste of it. It's true. Recently in BC, that's not something that we talked about, but I think that actually that. My audience knows what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just mean you and I. Yeah, no, I mean, that situation to me also brings, it brings us full circle because when Angelia Paterai made a run for the leadership of the party and by all accounts actually signed up so many people that she became a real threat to the party leadership, um, the very people who led that attack were that class of NDP officials who became lobbyists, corporate lobbyists. And so it kind of brings us to a full circle in that um, that that, cor- that kind of NDP official come corporate lobbyist is the kind of sharp right wing edge of the party now. And that's an example of what that that tendency in the party is willing to do, namely to engage in smear and sabotage tactics to prevent someone like Anjali from um, even getting a fair crack at um, a leadership challenge. So it's true. So we, w- we would see stuff like that. Um, and that is, a little, that is a taste of what might be to come in the future. Um, I think it's important to note there that the executive, right, you mentioned that, you know, maybe the executive would welcome a change Perhaps, but the not everyone on, in the executive. No, no, no I, because I, the executive is largely shaped by those people. Uh, they run the elections. They create a slate. They prop up the people that they need on the executive to rubber stamp everything they do. And those people that is supposed to be the democratic wing of the party. You know, we can lament about the unelected, but the elected are rubber stamping all of this, all of it. The the bad campaign ideas, the mic. All of it has been completely rubber stamped by members who went to convention and were elected by fellow members. Because a lot of these people, they operate outside of the Constitution, but in the end, almost everything important they need to do needs to pass through council and executive. And that was not a barrier at all in BC um, because of the way that they have spent 30 years Understanding even riding associations, making sure that the very key riding associations that are out there are held by staffers. Uh, those elections are just as controlled because they understand the level of membership lists that, and then delegates to convention. And it goes on like they have really sharpened all of their tools for quite some time. So um, there are good people in membership, but they have trouble even getting into a position where they can be heard uh, let alone vote on anything. But uh, we could talk about this for a long time, I feel like, especially the work you did around the Leap Manifesto, because I know you were largely involved with that. We didn't even get to talk about that or just, you know, relate on that level of trying desperately to turn the party left and, you know, just seeing efforts not wasted, but thwarted. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, we can we can talk about. I think we can we can just touch on the leap. I think to to leave things maybe on a more hopeful note. Um, I mean, the leap the the leap is part of a tradition of efforts to tra- transform the party, at least as it transpired at the 2016 convention. You know, there was a waffle in the late 60s and 70s. Um, there was a new politics initiative in the early 2000s, and those first two were defeated. What was interesting about the leap is that it wasn't so much defeated. It actually, it actually won the convention, but then the 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 battle wasn't even enjo- enjoined. You know what I mean? Like, um, no one emerged as a leap candidate to 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 contest the the leadership election, um, and so the party, in other words, didn't even have to thwart it. I mean, they did various things like to try to kind of stymie any energy that might have emerged out of the, the leap after it kind of won the convention. Um, you know, they, 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 they were, they were duty bound to host like debates in all the EDA electoral uh, district associations, but, um, 
all they did was send out a survey to be completed over the summertime when, of course, most people are on holiday. Um, and, uh, and of course, so nothing came out of that. But I think that um, on the leap side, nothing, there was no organizational effort mounted on that front either and, and no, no candidate emerged. So um, to my mind, it, it was actually a kind of a tie it wasn't really a defeat. It was um, it was a fight that wasn't really even even had. Um, but to to my mind, what was so powerful about that that moment is that there actually wasn't much organizing that went into that. the The membership into just bringing kind of, it to convention. Yeah, and the membership just just picked it up and ran with it. And and despite attacks from Rachel Notley, you know, who at the time was sitting premier, um, had an incredible amount of legitimacy. The convention was in Alberta, and even there, the Leap Manifesto passed. You know, and 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 in many ways, the politics of the Leap Manifesto, which are the politics of the Green New Deal, um, have come to, you know, have come to be something of common sense in the intervening like six, seven years. Um, so, if anything, I think that should should really give us hope, at least about where the party membership is of the party, that they uh, would be energized and enlivened and excited uh, by that kind of transformation. I remember being struck by when that resolution won at 2016, we at The Leap were getting more more calls than we could deal with from NDPers, former NDPers, people who had, who had left the party, who were like, what can we do? You know, I wanna I wanna go back into my writing association and organize. And the shame of that moment was that the pity of that moment was that there was nothing for them to get involved in. Um, but I don't think it's too late. If anything, obviously the climate crisis is not not becoming more mild. It's becoming a whole lot worse. And um, I think that there are many people inside and outside the party who would rise to the occasion. Um, if the opportunity afforded itself. So I just think we have to build our forces on the left in social movements um, and ready ourselves for the moment when that becomes possible. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, Jessa. That is a wrap on another episode of Blueprints of Disruption. Thank you for joining us. Also, a very big thank you to the producer of our show, Santiago Halu Quintero. Blueprints of Disruption is an independent production operated cooperatively. You can follow us on Twitter at BP of Disruption. If you'd like to help us continue disrupting the status quo, please share our content. And if you have the means, consider becoming a patron. Not only does our support come from the progressive community, so does our content. So reach out to us and let us know what or who we should be amplifying. So until next time, keep disrupting.